Hello everyone, it's Mr Thunderwing here, and today we're going to be taking another look at a slice of Sega arcade history as Afterburner turns 30 in 2017. I'm also going to be looking at the game's legacy, looking at its sequels, pseudo-sequels, home ports and spin-offs. Now it's time to dust off your aviator shades, get your flight suit on and put your tables and chairs back in their upright position as we blast off with the original Afterburner, which was cleared for takeoff in the arcade in 1987. Now, if you're anything like me, you may not have actually realised until fairly recently that there is actually a difference between Afterburner 1 and Afterburner 2. I mean, sure, you'd think the fact that one's got a 2 on the end of it would be a big giveaway, but for some reason when I was a child that just never seemed to register. The game that I thought was Afterburner was in fact Afterburner 2. And the footage you can see running in the background here is literally the first ever time I've played Afterburner 1. I think this is a fairly easy mistake to make though, because Afterburner 2 is basically just an update of the original game. Now once I move on to some footage of Afterburner 2, I will list all the differences in detail. But if you're very familiar with Afterburner 2, there's probably a couple of things you'll notice straight away. One of the first things I immediately noticed is the fact that the title screen is different in Afterburner 1, and so is the music that comes on when you actually credit up. You don't get the awesome maximum power tune from Afterburner 2. Once you actually get into the game itself, you'll notice as well that there's no throttle control so you can't change your speed or activate the afterburner. Your missiles also seem to take a very long time to fire. Once you've got a lock on, it's actually very hard to hit anything. And also, this version is hard as balls. You can see me here just dying over and over and over again within the space of seconds. Now, this could just be related to my general gaming ineptitude, but I'd like to think it's not. I don't know if the game's got a bit of a strange hit detection or something like that. Or maybe this version's just really difficult because I'm using a Japanese ROM to play the game. Now, having talked about the difference between the two different versions there, let's now move across to some footage of Afterburner 2. And you can immediately see a difference here in how the third stage looks in both games. Now, I'm going to stop talking for a little bit there while we delve into some Afterburner 2 facts. So for me, Afterburner 2 really is the definitive version of the game. This is the one that I grew up with. Now, as I've previously mentioned in the annotations, the game came in three distinct varieties in the arcade. A standard upright version, the deluxe super duper hydraulic version, and there was also a third type of hydraulic cabinet known as the commander version. And back when I was a fresh-faced idealistic young lad, there was an arcade not that far from me that actually had one of these Commander versions that you could play for only 30p a go, which was an absolute bargain back then. So next, let's move on to the home console and computer ports of Afterburner. Starting off with a look at the ones that I've either owned myself in the past or I've had access to, and then moving on to the other versions after that. Now, like my previous look at 30 years of Outrun, I'm going to be using a combination of footage that I've recorded myself here, and footage which I've obtained from YouTube. 
So for any footage I use, it wasn't something that I've recorded myself. I'll put the name of the uploader in the top right of the screen, as well as the name of the video, and I'll turn that into a link that you can click on at any point to actually go to it. So let's get the ball rolling by having a look at the first ever home computer version of Afterburner that I owned, which was for the ZX Spectrum 128K. Now, although the video that you can see running here isn't mine, I still do actually own a copy of this game, complete with the ZX Spectrum itself, which is currently living in a box somewhere in my parents' attic. Unlike the version here, mine was for the ZX Spectrum Plus 2, which meant I had to load it from a cassette, rather than a disk drive. Although this version does look very simplistic, I think when you take into account the limitations of the ZX Spectrum, it's not a bad conversion overall. And although the box art for the game didn't explicitly state this, this is actually a port of Afterburner 2. If I remember correctly, you were able to toggle the speed using the spacebar when you were playing with the joystick. So next up we have the Sega Master System version of Afterburner. Now I never actually owned this one back in the day, but I did borrow it off someone that I went to school with for quite a long time, so I did play this quite extensively when I was younger. And although this and the ZX Spectrum version both came out in 1988, we can see that this is actually a version of Afterburner 1, as evidenced by the lack of throttle controls and the matching title screen. Despite being based on the earlier version of the arcade game, this was obviously a huge step up for me compared to the ZX Spectrum, but when I used to play it back then, it didn't actually sound as good as the version of Afterburner that you can see me playing here, because I'm using an emulator for this, which actually emulates the Sega Master System's add-on FM sound unit. Something unique to Afterburner on the Sega Master System was that on certain stages you'd encounter boss fights against a much larger plane that you had to tactically shoot down by aiming at parts of the wings in the fuselage. Another interesting quirk of the Sega Master System version of this game is that by simply banking left or right you can actually make it through all the way to about the 12th stage without actually getting hit by any of the enemy missiles. You can see them all here just harmlessly flying past me. The next version of Afterburner that I owned was the Mega Drive version of Afterburner 2. And chuffin' heck, what an absolutely brilliant conversion this was. Whilst the Mega Drive isn't quite able to match the scaling effects of the original arcade hardware, I think it does a pretty decent job of trying to replicate it. The game moves at a pretty speedy pace, and thanks to the fact that the Mega Drive had a 3-button pad, it was able to replicate the original Afterburner 2's arcade throttle controls by assigning the A button to speed up and activate the afterburner, the C button to slow down, and then leaving the B button to fire the missiles whilst the Vulcan gun auto-fired on its own. The Mega Drive version also did a really good job at replicating the arcade soundtrack with suitably Mega Drive-y sounding versions of the original arcade game's iconic tunes. I'd even played the game, I was already very impressed when I first loaded it up and saw that it had a very faithful reproduction of the original Afterburner 2's arcade title screen. Right down to a pretty awesome rendition of the original arcade machine's title screen music.
All in all, I think this is an absolutely brilliant port, which is all the more surprising considering it was handled by a third-party developer called Demper, rather than by Sega themselves. If you're a Sega Mega Drive owning fan of Afterburner, then this is definitely a must for your collection. So let's move on from the Sega Mega Drive now to the last version of Afterburner that I owned, and in fact which I still do own. So this is of course the version of Afterburner 2 that came on Sega Ages Volume 1 for the Sega Saturn. Ready. And here we've saved the best for last, as this really is, as far as I can see, an absolutely arcade perfect version of Afterburner 2. Apart from the lovely big black borders you can see at the top and the bottom of the screen, because this is the PAL version. It's got all the fantastic music from the arcade game, it's got the same big bold sprite scaling graphics complete with the huge explosions that look like they're coming right at the screen into your face and it even plays very very faithfully to the arcade game as well considering that I'm just using a regular D-pad for it. Now back in the day I actually bought this game on a bit of a whim. It was in the dying days of the Saturn and I was thinking about possibly jumping ship to a PS1 at some point as there weren't really any Saturn games that I still wanted to buy anymore, I'd got all the ones that I wanted. Now at this particular point in the 90s, 2D games were a bit old hat. There's 3D polygon games like Virtua Fighter, Daytona USA and Ridge Racer were now the new in thing. But I'm so glad that I did decide to buy this game because once I booted it up for the first time and realised that I actually had a properly arcade perfect version of Afterburner at home I was pretty dumbfounded. Now in this day and age where PCs and consoles are easily able to replicate what you can see in the average arcade you're probably thinking that doesn't sound like that big of a deal but back then being able to play a truly arcade perfect version of one of your favourite arcade games was a novelty. Now one of the other awesome things about this game was because of the fact it came on this newfangled CD technology, it meant I could actually put it into my stereo and listen to all those awesome rocking Afterburner 2 tunes through a proper pair of decent speakers. So those are all the home versions of Afterburner that I either owned or was able to play when I was younger. Now, moving on from that, let's have a quick look at all of those side by side before moving on to the other home ports. Now, initially when I was putting the footage together for this video, I was quite surprised by the golfing quality between the Atari ST and the Amiga version of Afterburner, particularly when you consider how equally piss poor the versions of Outrun looked on those two systems. But looking into the subject a little bit more, it turns out that there were actually two different versions of Afterburner, released for the USA and the European market on the Amiga, and also for the Commodore 64. So what you're seeing here is the USA version of Afterburner, which doesn't look half bad, it's actually pretty comparable to the Sega Mega Drive version.
By way of comparison, this is the version that we got in Europe. It looks pretty shit really, doesn't it, comparatively? Quite why whoever programmed this game decided to border the screen with this ugly heads-up display type thing, I've got absolutely no idea. Particularly when the USA version of this game shows that they could quite easily have actually matched the aesthetic of the arcade without any problems. And we can see here that the Commodore 64 version of Afterburner on the right looks light years ahead of the European version on the left. It looks closer to the Sega Master System version than the home computer version. Now next up we have the MSX version of Afterburner. Now this version seems like a little bit of a strange one to me, because it seems to be pretty much an identical port of the ZX Spectrum version. And the reason that I think that that seems like a weird thing is because when I had a look at the home ports of OutRun during my 30 years of OutRun video, the MSX version looked closer to something like the Sega Master System version, rather than the monochromatic visuals of the ZX Spectrum. This is the DOS version. The music makes me want to shoot myself in the face. So these are all the home computer ports of Afterburner and Afterburner 2 that I'm aware of. So let's now move on from this to the rest of the console ports that I haven't already covered. But before that, let's have a quick look at all the home computer versions side by side. So we've already had a look at the Sega Master System, Sega Mega Drive and Sega Saturn versions of Afterburner. Let's have a quick look now at some of the other home console ports, starting off with the PC Engine version. Next up is the Sega 32X version. Now, I never actually got to play this version back in the day, and I think a lot of the games magazines at the time said that this version was arcade perfect. And it is extremely close looking, but I think that the frame rate is just a tiny bit less smooth than the Saturn version. There was also a port of Afterburner for the Sega Dreamcast as part of a compilation called Yu Suzuki Gameworks Volume 1. Utilising the power of the mighty Dreamcast, this was of course an Arcade Perfect port. And the compilation also included Arcade Perfect versions of other notable Yu Suzuki games such as Outrun, Hang On, Power Drift and Space Harrier. The most recent port of Afterburner has been for the Nintendo 3DS. This version includes enhancements to the game, such as a replay mode, the ability to change the HUD options around the screen to make it look like you're playing in an actual Afterburner cabinet, variations on the original Afterburner musical arrangements, and an enhanced gameplay mode that gets unlocked when you finish the game that gives you a gauge that you can fill up 
which will let you slow down time as you take down enemies, a feature that's prominent in a certain other Afterburner game we're going to be talking about a bit later. The 3DS wasn't the first Nintendo handheld to receive its own version of Afterburner though. Before that was Sega Arcade Gallery for the Game Boy Advance, which also contained ports of Outrun, Super Hang On and Space Harrier. Whilst the compilation pack itself received fair to middling reviews, Afterburner was picked out as being one of the weaker titles on it, with criticism being levelled at the game for its lack of speed, tiny sprites and lack of background detail, and the fact that it didn't seem to recapture the frenetic energy of the original arcade version. But the Game Boy Advance wasn't even the first Nintendo system to get a copy of Afterburner. Before that, there was a version released for the Nintendo Entertainment System by a company called Tengen. Now whilst I've already featured two Nintendo System versions of Afterburner here already, back then, Nintendo and Sega were bitter rivals, and this game was in fact completely unlicensed. Tengen had successfully reverse engineered the NES's copyright protection chip, and then promptly took it upon themselves to start releasing a load of bootleg, completely unlicensed games on the system. The Big N were understandably not happy about this and took Tengen to court, suing them for both patent and copyright infringement, preventing them from producing their illegally created games. Now, this version of Afterburner released by Tengen was for the US market, but in Japan, the game was rebranded as Afterburner 2 and released for the Famicom, the Japanese equivalent of the NES, by the company Sunsoft. The game boasted some cosmetic improvements over its US counterpart, such as reduced flicker, enhanced music and a slightly different colour palette. Now, to be completely honest with you, I'm not 100% certain how things lie with the legality of this game. At the end of the day, it's still a Sega arcade game coming out on the NES, at a time when Sega and Nintendo were rivals and they wouldn't have been producing games for each other. And whilst the case of Nintendo vs Tengen is pretty well known, I can't find any similar information at all to suggest that either Nintendo or Sega had any dispute with Sunsoft. So this Japanese Famicom version of Afterburner 2 is a bit of a strange one. I really don't know if it's a dodgy bootleg or if it was officially released or what. Take control of your own F-14 jet fighter and experience all the thrills of real battle action with Tiger's new electronic tabletop arcade game, Afterburner. Destroy yeah, all the thrills of real arcade battle action. My arse. This was simply a larger version of this crappy LCD version of Afterburner that was released by Tiger in the US and by Grandstand in the UK. Also new from Tiger, Outrun, the electronic auto race game. So that concludes our look at all the home versions of Afterburner. Let's have a quick look at all the console versions side by side, and then we'll add in the computer versions as well. Sega's first true sequel to Afterburner arrived in the arcade in 1990 in the form of G-Lock, which stood for Loss of Consciousness by G-Force. But wouldn't that have spelt out Lock-Bugifer? 
I guess that just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. In g -Lock, the player's view was changed from a third to a first-person perspective. The game also brought in a new timer-based gameplay mechanic, whereby the player had to shoot down a certain amount of ships in order to proceed to the next level. g -Lock also worked with Sega's R360 cabinet. The cabinet had two axes of movement, which allowed the player to move through a full 360 degrees, including completely upside down. Now, I thought that g -Lock was actually the first Sega game to use this R360 cabinet, but apparently both Power Drift and Galaxy Force had used it before this. I never actually got to play g -Lock in the arcade, and I can't remember ever seeing one either in either its sit-down or stand-up form. There were ports for the Sega Mega Drive Master System and Game Gear, as well as the Amiga and Commodore 64, but my first experience of playing it has actually come through emulation using MAME. I really don't think I've missed out on anything by not getting to play this in the arcade, though g -Lock really does seem to me like a poor man's afterburner. The music's rubbish, the gameplay is slow. Whilst the graphics have got that nice solid look of a Sega 2D arcade game, just in the little bit that I played there seems to be a lack of variety in the enemy jet types. You seem to spend the whole time shooting down other F-14s for some weird reason. And I really don't like this new style of gameplay where you've got to shoot down a certain amount of targets within a time limit. All in all, I think you're better off sticking with the original Afterburner than playing this. Next off the launch pad in 1991 was Strike Fighter, which only saw a release in Japanese arcades. Whilst graphically this obviously shares a lot in common with G-Lock, this does feel like a game that's more faithful to the original Afterburner, having both a faster pace and also getting rid of the time limit based mission structures of the other game. The music's even a little bit better as well, but it's still not a patch on the original Afterburner in my opinion. Strike Fighter had home ports to the FM Towns personal computer and to the Sega CD add-on for the Sega Mega Drive, and this is the version that you can see playing here. The ports weren't handled by Sega themselves, but by a company called CRI, and yes, I've never heard of them either. Now what's interesting about the home versions of Strike Fighter is the fact that they changed the name to Afterburner 3, so this actually cements the game's place in the pantheon of Afterburner history. So it's just a real shame then that the name change seems to be just about the only thing that is interesting about this port. When you consider that this came out on the Sega CD, there really isn't that much of an improvement over the Mega Drive's graphics. There's barely any detail on the ground, aside from a few tiny sprites, and there's no detail at all in the sky. Additionally, trying to avoid the enemy missiles feels more like a matter of luck sometimes. I think about the only thing that this game has got going for it are some pretty good arrangements of the original Afterburner soundtrack and CD quality. But seriously though, what were they thinking when they came up with this continue music? And also my first reaction here was, what the fuck actually hit me? Oh, 
I subsequently realise those things on the floor are actually shooting at me. One of the only other things about Afterburner 3 that was noteworthy was the fact the game started off with an FMV intro, telling you how super duper awesome the F-14 is, and also providing some intel on your current mission. Here's a little excerpt from it. Command headquarters let you know this morning that the enemy is building airfields and bases all over the desert. They're protecting those bases with squadrons of their best interceptors. Your job is to take out those bases. If you have to knock down a few enemy planes, so much the better. Just you and your F-14. With a good pilot, it's holy terror. With you, it should be unstoppable. Anyway, that's more than enough time spent with Afterburner 3. Let's move on to our next game. Sky Target was a 1995 release for the Sega Model 2 arcade board. As well as having some fairly bitchin' title music, Sky Target was also Sega's first arcade-style afterburner game to actually use polygons rather than 2D graphics. Whilst this doesn't share the afterburner name, I think the influence is pretty obvious here, complete with the F-14 and everything, and returning the action to the familiar third-person behind the jet viewpoint. So this is another afterburner type game that managed to pass me by in the arcade. And my first experiences with this game have been using the Sega Model 2 emulator on my PC. And using a little bit of upscaling magic in the emulator's in-game options, I think this game actually still looks pretty good. Particularly when you consider that this is running on arcade hardware that's over 20 years old now. Similarly to the other sequels that we've looked at so far, the pace of Sky Target does seem to be considerably slower than Afterburner. And much like Afterburner 1, there is no way to change the speed of your F-14 in this game. I don't think by any means that's a deal breaker though, and this still does seem like a very fun game. And I imagine back in 1995, if you saw this running in an arcade, you would have been very impressed by the graphics. Sega Strike, Fighter. Sega Strike Fighter was released into the arcade in the year 2000, running on Sega's Naomi arcade hardware. Now, the link here to the original Afterburner could be getting a little bit tenuous, but the extensive research that I've done on the internet, <coughs> cough, Wikipedia, <coughs> cough, does seem to indicate that this is part of the Afterburner series. And hey, it's a game about jets made by Sega for the arcade. And it even shares part of its name as Strike Fighter, which if you were paying attention earlier, you'll know was later renamed into Afterburner 3 when it got released for the home systems. In terms of gameplay though, the game doesn't bear much relation to the original Afterburner, focusing instead on a more simulation-centred style of gameplay. The arcade version even came in a three-screen mode. Here you can see me playing it, badly, using the emulated D-Mule, the audio in this video came out a little bit distorted, so let's just watch a little bit of this with a bit more of that awesome Sky Target music. In 2004, a version of Afterburner 2 came out for the PlayStation 2 as part of the Sega Ages 2500 range.
like the 3D remake of Outrun that came after it, this was rather a low quality affair unfortunately, with some fairly budget basement looking graphics. But similarly to the remake of Outrun on the PlayStation 2, I do have a bit of a soft spot for this game. As well as the regular arcade mode, there's also an arranged mode that gives you a selection of extra ships that you can use, including what looks like a Cobra Rattler there from G.I. Joe. In the original Afterburner 2, there were two sections where the plane would land and refuel. In the first instance, a bike would come out and follow you up the runway, and then in the second, a car would do the same. Now, the popular school of thought about this was that these were homages to Hang On and Outrun. Another thought is that the bike could actually be a reference to Top Gun. I mean, I'm pretty certain they've already used the digitised version of Tom Cruise during the game's attract mode. I mean, if I put this actual picture of Tom Cruise next to that one, you can see just how similar they are. Anyway, I'm veering off the point a little bit of what I originally meant to say about this, which was that in the Sega Ages version of Afterburner 2, you can clearly see when the bike comes out onto the runway that it is definitely the one from Hang On. And in a similar fashion, you can see that this is quite obviously meant to be the Outrun car, complete with the same looking male and female passenger. After a period of relative inactivity in the arcade, in 2006, Afterburner finally came back with a bang. Afterburner Climax. Running on Sega's powerful Lindeberg hardware, this was exactly the sort of modern update the series needed. It takes everything that was so good about the original Afterburner 2 and turns it up to 11. The graphics are absolutely fantastic, the game moves incredibly fast, the soundtrack is brilliant. There's even an option that lets you play the game with the original Afterburner 2 soundtrack, which as bonuses go is pretty goddamn awesome! <laughs> The game also features something called a Climax Mode, which has nothing to do with what you're thinking about, you dirty bastard. The Climax gauge in the bottom left of the screen would fill up the more enemy planes that you shot. Once activated, the Climax Mode would slow down time, allowing you to dispense your own brand of slow motion, missile related justice to the enemy forces of Zebra. That's what they're called. The bad guys. In this. In any way, I'm English, damn it. It's Zebra, not Zebra. In 
2010, Afterburner Climax got ported over to the Xbox 360 and the PS3, and the PS3 version is the one that you can see me playing here. Arcade conversions seem to be a bit of a rarity these days, so I'm amazed that this game actually even came out on the home systems, but I'm so grateful it did, because it's awesome, I absolutely love it. There have even been versions of Afterburner Climax brought out for the iOS and Android systems. The game also features stages that put your navigation skills to the test as you have to fly through large structures. The game also features secret stages which will be unlocked when certain conditions are met, as well as EX options which will also get unlocked. In the gameplay featured here I'm using some of those EX options, such as an extra large targeting reticule here, and also the ability to auto fire the missiles and the guns. Don't judge me, I'm old and rubbish, I need all the help I can get at games these days. As you can see from the map here charting my progress, the game does actually feature a branching structure, a bit like Outrun. The game gives you a choice of three different planes to use right from the outset, as well as several different colour choices for them to come in. As modern day continuations of an old franchise go, I think this is right up there with the best of them. And like Outrun 2 did for the original Outrun, I think this game is more than a fitting testament to the Afterburner legacy. However, the story doesn't end here. Afterburner Black Falcon was a PlayStation Portable exclusive that came out in 2007. At the start of the game you get to choose between one of three pilots with super awesome names like Sonic, Bull and Shinsei. The game's plot revolves around a terrorist group who've stolen a load of prototype fighter jets because reasons. At the start of the game you have a certain amount of funds that you can use to purchase a jet and the weapons that you want to equip it with. Now in all honesty I haven't really played through this enough to know exactly how the intricacies of this purchasing system work. I basically just wanted to try and get a little bit of video capture of this game which I've done with the PlayStation Portable emulator called PPSSPP. Once you get in game with the emulator using this particular game, the audio is a bit messed up, so I am going to cut away just to a bit of regular audio uh, from earlier on in the game. So I do actually quite like the way this game looks, although obviously it's no afterburner climax. One aspect of the game though that definitely isn't quite so good is the speed, which definitely seems to have taken a step backwards from afterburner climax in terms of slowing things down again. 
It's also worth pointing out here as well that whilst Afterburner Climax was developed in-house by the behemoth that is Sega AM2, Afterburner Black Falcon was produced by a third-party company called Planet Moon Studios. And yes, I've never heard of them either. Now, I haven't played this game enough to really give you like a proper opinion of it, but just from the little bit I played it does seem pretty fun. But according to review aggregate site Metacritic, the game did receive average reviews, which I suppose is better than bad ones. One thing that is unique about this game in the world of Afterburner though, is the fact that it supports numerous multiplayer challenges in both 8 player competitive and 2 player cooperative modes. Now whilst the home versions of Afterburner Climax were released 3 years after this, Afterburner Black Falcon does actually represent the last game in the Afterburner series so far, because the original Afterburner Climax came out in the arcade, as we mentioned before, in 2006. So whilst that wraps up our look at all of Afterburner's sequels, there is still a bit of Afterburner Legacy stuff to talk about. And the first time Afterburner's iconic F-14 jet appeared in a game that wasn't an Afterburner one, was in a slightly surprising place. Power Drift was a 1988 kart racing game by Sega that let you use the F-14 as an unlockable craft on one of the bonus stages if you'd managed to meet certain conditions during your races. Bayonetta was a Sega produced action brawler game that was made by Platinum Games. One of the stages involves a motorcycle chase, whilst the original Afterburner's main theme plays in the background in a remixed rearranged form. And this theme was then later reused in the Wii U version of Super Smash Bros. My personal favourite homage to Afterburner is in Sonic and All Star Rating Transformed, which not only features an entire level based around Afterburner, but also includes a version of the F 14 as the flying form of the final unlockable character in the game. The Afterburner 2 theme was also used in a rhythm action game by Sega, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce the title of because I think I'm going to get it wrong. There was also apparently a reference to Afterburner in the final stage of another one of Platinum Games' games, uh, called Mad World. Finish. Congratulations, first place! And with the completion of the race, uh, we have now come to the end of 30 years of Afterburner. 
If you've made it this far, thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you're a fan of the Afterburner series, then I hope you've enjoyed the video. And if you're unfamiliar with it, then why not give some of these games a try? I'm sure you'll love them. Because the chances are pretty high that at some point in the past, you've either played a game that's been directly inspired, or at least in some way influenced by Afterburner. And so there we have it, 30 years of Afterburner. All that remains now is for me to say thank you for watching once again. My name is Mr Thundering and I will hopefully catch you again sometime soon.